accounting equation and Excel, accounts payable and related subsidiary ledger. Get ready and some coffee because we're learning the accounting foundation, the accounting equation in Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in Excel. If you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we basically built this from a blank worksheet but started in a prior presentation. So if you wanna build this entire worksheet from a blank sheet, you may wanna begin back there or you could just follow along creating your own worksheet as you go or possibly just use good old paper and pencil. If you do have access to this workbook though, three tabs down below, example, practice, blank, example, in essence, the answer key, the practice tab having pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab, the one we will be working on is where we started with a blank worksheet but are continuing in essence with a template adding to the template as needed as we go. Let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we will be doing. We are continuing on entering our beginning balances, imagining that we had a business we started before in a prior accounting system, and now we want to transfer those beginning balances into our current accounting system, focusing in on the problem areas, those areas that will typically have subsidiary ledgers. So here is our worksheet giving us basic those beginning balances that we want to put in play noting that we can't just do one large journal entry because although that works from a double entry accounting system we would be in balance with just one big journal entry there's a lot of subsidiary ledgers that we have to deal with in prior presentations we started with possibly the most difficult one that being inventory because you typically need a flow assumption of course if you don't have inventory then that won't be a problem we then went to accounts receivable, meaning that represents customers that owe us money, also needing a subsidiary ledger breaking out by who owes us the money, that being by customer. Again, if you don't have accounts receivable, then that will be an easier process as well. The next one, similar kind of scenario, most related to the accounts receivable, that being the accounts payable. We're on the liability side this time. So on the accounts payable, uh, we're going to have the amount that we owe to vendors, the people that we purchase stuff from. Most likely, if we sell inventory, that being the people we purchase the inventory from, but it could be any other vendor that we pay for things such as electricity, the telephone, and so on, so forth. Therefore, we need not only the balance that is due, but also the people that we owe it to, that being by vendor. Now, also remember that if you're thinking about doing business with, with people and being a bookkeeper or working in an accounting department, if you're working for smaller types of companies, you might be able to structure your business model as a bookkeeper to customize it. And you might say, well, I don't want to do an accrual component. I want to be more of a cashed bookkeeper so that I can use bank feeds to do the prim primary part of my transactions, which will streamline the process more. That means you're dealing with customers that might not be uh, doing work where they have to invoice, but rather they're getting paid at the same point in time. However, that's a little bit more difficult on the receivable side of things, even for small businesses, because if you're in a service industry, you're going to have to invoice customers. That's just the way it works. If, if you are a bookkeeper, if you're a lawyer, if you're a landscaper, you most likely have to do the work first and then invoice the client and then try to collect on that. Uh, and that's just kind of the way it is. But on the accounts payable side, it's quite common that small businesses might not be tracking the accounts payable because they're just paying the bills as they become due, either with the use of the bank feeds, paying it out of their checking account, or possibly with the use of credit cards. 
uh, paying them as they become due. Both of those can be done basically electronically and streamline the process a little bit uh, quicker. The reason small businesses don't as often really track accounts payable as closely as possibly larger businesses is because the time frame of when you pay the bill is not quite as important. Meaning, if, if I pay an electricity bill that's $100 either today when I got the bill or 15 days from now when the bill is actually due, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to get the bill and I'm going to pay it. When I get the bill, I would like to automate that entire transaction to save my time because that's the most valuable resource and typically the bottleneck that we're trying to kind of conserve on a small business, right? I want to free up our time so that we can spend it doing other things rather than uh, the bookkeeping. Now that loses a little bit of the time value of money because of inflation, however, for that 15 days, but the dollar amount is small and the number of transactions are small. If you have a larger company, then you're dealing with larger dollar amounts and more transactions. And therefore that 15 day time period per transaction, which might be bigger, and because of the number of transactions becomes important. If you are a credit card company, for example, you're going to try to hold on to every transaction as long as possible, improving your cash flow because the, that little bit of time is important when you have that high volume of transactions. So therefore, if your accounts payable specialist, you will probably be specializing in a larger company working specifically in accounts payable, trying to maximize cash flow with the use of cash discounts and paying as, as late as possible and dealing with vendors to get the most favorable terms to pay as late as possible and so on and so forth. If you're a small business and you're doing bookkeeper for small businesses, you might not be dealing with the accounts payable as much, but rather that side of things is what you might be able to automate and specialize in automating it with the help and use of bank feeds, both with the credit cards as well as the bank feeds. Okay, that said, we're gonna put it on books in a similar process here. So we're gonna say, let's go to our, our um, blank tab. And so I'm gonna say this happens on 1-1 one, because one, we're gonna put all of our information as of the beginning of the current period. I'm gonna say this is the beginning balance for accounts payable. And I'm gonna say that we only have one vendor this time. So I'll just list it out, Epiphone. So we owe Epiphone. Now, now Ep if I spell that right, Epi now Epiphone. I'm not sure I spelled that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. But this is the vendor that we pay uh, to buy gu our guitars. So it's already on the books. We already bought the guitar in the prior accounting system. I'm just gonna put it on the books now uh, as our beginning balance. Okay, so the beginning balance, what's that gonna look like then? Well, the accounts payable needs to be going up from our accounting equation standpoint, up by that 15,000, doot, 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 boom. And where does the other side go? The other side would have gone to inventory, uh, but let's imagine, and ultimately, if it went to inventory, where would it ultimately go when we sell the inventory? It would go to an expense account of cost of goods sold. However, let's imagine a more basic scenario. Let's imagine it was the telephone expense. If it was a telephone expense, then when we get the when we get the the bill from the client, which is the paper bill, which isn't as specific terminology as the data input form of a bill. We could simply pay that bill when we get it. If we were to pay it when we get it, we would decrease cash and record the expense at that point in time. Or I'm going to get the paper bill and enter it into the system as a bill form. The bill form for most accounting softwares is now the data input form. That's specifically what it is. It's a data input form that will increase the accounts payable. So in other words, you could get a bill or it could be called an invoice from normal language terminology, not very, not as specific as the data input forms. You get the bill or the invoice from the telephone company and you could just pay it with what we would call a check form, even though it would be an electronic transfer, decreasing the checking account, not entering a bill form into the accounting software. Or you could take the bill or invoice, whatever, from the telephone company and enter it into our system as a bill data input form, which specifically means that we're not yet paying it. We're increasing the accounts payable 
and we're going to then track it and pay it when it becomes due, trying to hold on to our money as long as possible and pay it when it becomes due, right? If it was a telephone bill, that means we would ex record the expense at that point in time, and then we would record the, the other side going to the accounts payable, and then when we pay it, decrease the accounts payable, decrease the checking account. So this means that if the accounts payable was for an expense that we purchased in the past, rather than inventory, just to make it a little bit easier to think about, then we already recorded the expense, right? It was recorded in the prior accounting system, which was done before the period end, before 1231, December 31st, the end of the year. And then because we're starting in January, that expense account would have rolled into retained earnings. So that's why I don't have to record it as an expense at this point in time. We're just going to record it into the equity as part of basically the equity. So I'm going to put it into equity. Now, notice that if you're in accounting software and you're entering the beginning balances, what would you have to do? You'd have to enter a vendor and, and say there's a beginning balance for the vendor. The system will typically create what kind of form increases accounts payable? A bill form. So it'll probably just create a generic bill form increasing accounts payable. Because it does that, uh, depending on the software, it might automatically put the other side not to equity, but to some kind of expense. It might make up an expense account called beginning balance expense or something like that because it needs to be in balance. That's going to be a problem if you entered it as of January 1st, because that expense shouldn't be there. You're going to have to then remove it from the expense and put it into equity. Or you could enter all of your beginning balance transactions as of December 31st of the prior year in your accounting software. By doing that, even if it enters it as an expense, it will roll into an equity account because of the closing process done automatically by the accounting software and then we'll be good as of the point in time that we wanna be working going forward, and that being January of the current year. Okay, but we're just gonna put it directly into our equity. So it's gonna increase the equity, boom. So let's put some zeros across the board. Zeros across the board. Du, 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 du. Nothing's on the income statement. And then I'm also going to say in my subledger, the subledger, I'm going to structure it a little bit differently than you might see in accounting software, but I think it's as streamlined a structure as we can get. That being just like we did with the accounts receivable, I'm going to break out the customers in the columns, have the increases and decreases by column. I'm not by customer, by vendor. Customer was the, <laughs> the accounts receivable. Increases and decreases by vendor, and then we'll have the total on the right-hand side. So I think that's the most streamlined way to do it here in excel so let's say this is going to be epiphone and that's who we buy our guitars from and then we're going to be down here because i want to be on the same line and this will be equal to scrolling all the way to the right that fifteen thousand. so we have an increase in the sub ledger for the vendor of epiphone i'm going to format this making it white for the text because that's our custom and we didn't do that before home tab font group Let's make it white to make it look nice. It needs to line up with the other stuff. All right, then we're going to say this equals the running balance, the one above it, which is zero, plus the 15,000. So that means we have 15,000. This amount should tie into our general ledger or in essence, the account on our accounting equation. And this is who we owe the money to, just one vendor at this point in time. We'll get more vendors and get a more complex subsidiary ledger in future presentations. All right, let's put some let's put some underlines under this and put a balance underline underline and then underline. By the way, if you enter this into your accounting system, uh, you also even though the system will enter a bill uh, form usually to record it, if you entered this into like a QuickBooks as the beginning balance of a vendor, you're not going to have the detail of the bill because because it's just going to record it generically to the equity or to the uh to the expense account of like of like beginning balance expense or something like that so and that's consistent with our th idea here that we're only entering the beginning balances because the original bill 
was entered prior to this accounting system, I would have to go to the prior accounting system to check what the bill was actually for. What was the expense account we hit with the bill, right? I don't really care what the expense account we hit with the bill was in our current accounting system, as long as everything moves smoothly, as long as I know that I owe the bill so I can properly pay the bill, that's good, that's good. But if there's a problem with the bill, then we're gonna have to go back to the prior accounting system, which has the original bill that was entered and applied to the, to the proper place. The same is true with the accounts receivable. When we enter the accounts receivable in like a QuickBooks, the QuickBooks will create three, these three invoices most likely, but it's not gonna give me all the detail of the invoice. It's just, I'm just recording what I need to record to get the beginning balance in place so that I can then collect on it in the future. If I wanna get a more detailed representation of the invoice, I could enter the invoice uh, with a more detailed representation of it as of the prior year 1231 or the date of the invoice but that's a lot more tedious the idea here would be i just want to get the beginning balances down so i can collect from the proper customers and if they have an issue with the the invoice itself i'd have to go back to the prior accounting system look at the invoice after these invoices have been paid then we'll have all of our future invoices and bills that will be made from the current accounting system and everything will be good going forward. So this is part of the problem of, which always happens when, if you're a bookkeeping artist, like a like someone that, that cleans up messy books, which is a specialty, right? That's what um, almost all small bookkeepers have to do to some degree. You're gonna take a mess that the, either the client made or the prior accounting system made or something like that and you're going to go in and you're going to fix it right and how can the only way you can do that typically is to say i'm going to i'm going to accept that it was a mess up to this point in time i'm not going to go back 10 years in the past and try to fix everything that was a problem and so on and so forth i'm going to draw the line i'm going to bring over the beginning balances i'm going to restructure everything as best i can going from this point going forward and if we have questions about the prior accounting system we'll go into the prior accounting system to answer those individual uh, questions as best we can as they come up and then hopefully as time passes we'll be clean uh with the new system going forward that's you know a common a common thing you might again some people might be quite good at doing that kind of thing some people actually that's what they do right they go and they fix the problem and then they once they have it running smooth you can hand it off to somebody else again right so let's copy this down and then we'll copy this down so liabilities went up by the 15,000 and the uh, equity went up by the 15,000 and why am I out of balance uh, because equity should be going down okay equity should be going down man because uh there we go so that's oh now i got a circle reference that's the wrong fifteen thousand. all right so there it is <laughs> all right that makes sense that's why the double entry accounting system is here that's why we do it so you don't mess things up all of those mistakes i've made along the way those were intentionally done for example purposes obviously uh, i shouldn't have done that for let's copy this down copy this down copy that down and then uh copy this down so what is happening here oh i need to hit my balances okay and let's get rid of the underlines here and underlines here and then we'll sum it up all right let's sum up the balance let's put our we have to sum up the balance equals the sum here's the prior balance from here down to the current activity boom i'm going to copy that paste it across pasting it value or formulas only and then we'll paste it formulas only and then we'll paste it formulas only and then we'll double check our accounting equation once again and see if i messed it up so 
23,396 and then liabilities 15 and equity is this. So this plus this equals to 23,396. The book value of the company then is the 23,396 minus the 15,000 equals the equity, the amount of the assets claimed by the owner rather than the, um, rather than the third party liabilities at 8,396. Now that, again, that amount, if it was a sole proprietor, as we're looking at here, would just be one number. If it was a partnership, you'd have to further break that out between the partners in different capital accounts. And if it was a corporation, you might break it out between retained earnings and the, and the investment, which would be the stock issuance, because then the claims to the equity by the owners is evenly distributed through the shares, which are whoever has whatever number of shares has equal representation of the of the ownership. But note that if you were to liquidate the company, the idea would be that you would be able to get 8,396 at this point in time, if this was the everything at this point in time. But notice to liquidate the company, I don't have any cash yet. So just it's just a good exercise just to think about what does that look like? Well, if you say the value of the company is that 8,396, how would you get that? You could sell the company and try to get that, or you could try to collect on your receivables, 20,500, sell the inventory for at least the cost of the inventory, 2,896, which would give you that 23,396, and then you'd have to pay off the vendor 15,000 before you can close the company. And after you pay off the vendor, you would be left with assets of 8,396, which would then match the owner's equity. And then you can liquidate the company paying yourself out of the business checking account to your checking account, the 8,396 and lower the equity to liquidate. So it's, it's useful just to see how you would unwind this whole thing and what that would look like to get an idea of what it means to say the value of the company book value of the company is in essence the equity in this case the 8396 because it doesn't mean that you could just overnight just just get that money you'd have to liquidate the company sell the company or again if you sold off the assets you you'd have to sell the assets in order to get the cash and then pay off the liabilities all right